All right, sounds like we are live. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Aaron Boyd, and I'm the Senior Editor for Technology and Events at NextGov, a division of Government Executive Media Group. Thank you for joining us for today's event, Testing Government's Connection, the Work From Home Digital Summit. This digital summit will explore how the at-home government workforce is solving challenges today and what the future may hold. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen, you'll find a Q&A button, which allows you to ask a question of the speakers. We'll be filling those toward the end of the program, but we encourage you to submit questions at any point along the way so we can get right to it. If you experience any technical difficulties, just click the help icon and a member of our support team will assist you. For this session entitled Securing Your Remote Connection, we brought together top federal information and cybersecurity leaders to investigate how agencies set up their remote software capabilities and how they're educating their employees on staying cyber secure when working remotely. Joining us for this session are Sean Connolly, Tech Program Manager at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, Stephen Hernandez, CISO for the U.S. Department of Education and Vice Chair of the Federal CISO Council, and Meg Vorland, Chief Strategy Officer at Decode. Thank you all for joining us. Let's go ahead and dive right in with some, uh, some brief introductions. Uh, Sean, can you tell the audience who you are, what that, that title uh, we said means, and how your work relates to working remotely and securely? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, the NextGov team. Uh, my name is Sean Connolly. I work for CISA. I lead the TIC program at CISA and TIC, Trusted Internet Connections. It's how the federal agencies connect to external networks. Um, for the last couple of years, we're hearing about agencies connecting to cloud. Is cloud external or internal? And so in September, OMB released their new memo on how to uh, uh, connect to new environments, including cloud. And then in December, my agency, CISA, we released some inter or, I'm sorry, some draft guidance reflecting that new policy. And then also in April, we released some interim guidance for agencies telling them how they could support uh, telework uh, uh, surges or telework infrastructure based on the new guidance. Mm. Yeah, I think it, uh, I'm sure there's no one at home right now who isn't aware of the current situation, but just a level set or for, you know, historians in the future looking back on this recording, uh, we are in the midst of a pandemic and much of the government is working from home right now. Uh, and so the, the guidance that you were talking about, Sean, you, you all put that out in April to try to help agencies get a handle on managing everyone working from home. And we're going to dig in a little bit more into what that says in a bit and, and what you're going to do beyond that as well. Uh, Stephen, you're up next. Uh, who are you? What do you do? Hey, good morning, folks. Stephen Hernandez here. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at the U.S. Department of Education. And uh, as noted, I'm also the Vice Chair of the Federal CISO Council. So uh, a pretty big plate at the agency level. I'm responsible for effectively everything cybersecurity. Uh, the Federal Information Security Moderner Modernization Act is my bailiwick there. A uh, lot of interaction with the privacy folks as well in the Privacy Act space and also FITARA and how we effectively leverage IT. Uh, the current pandemic situation um, has been fascinating to watch from a security perspective and be engaged in. Um, in many cases, it has been a catalyst for us to really push the envelope in what we're able to do at our agency, not only in terms of technology, but in terms of how we're training our workforce to be secure, uh, leveraging new capabilities in a rapid, agile fashion that perhaps we weren't able to leverage before. And then at the federal level, how we're bringing these lesson learns together, uh, frankly, through the lens of the president's management agenda. And we're looking at IT modernization, data and accountability, how we're using it, and then that workforce piece and how we're evolving the workforce to meet these ever-changing, not only threat environments, but operational environments. So we've got a lot going on, really excited to be here and unpack some of this uh, with Sean and the other speakers, and happy to be here. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, thank you. And Meg, last but not least, uh, what is Decode? How does it fit into this puzzle? Yeah, so Meg Borland, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Decode, and um, so sometimes when I say CFO or uh, CSO, people think security officer, but um, it's strategy officer. So I oversee our technology accelerator program, um, as well as the work that we do with the federal government. Uh, so Decode is the premier accelerator focused on security and missions across the federal government. Um, so we run about five accelerator programs a year centered on dual use technology. So we touch 
um, technology in the data space, AIML, geospatial, but we also run a specific cyber cohort every year. Um, and as you can imagine, um, we have to do, because the federal government is, is the customer for a lot of these technologies, we do a lot of vetting around, um, are they ready for the gov security requirements? How can they fit in? How can they get there? Um, and then on the flip side, we also work with the government and government leaders on how to de-risk and test emerging technology to solve some of their challenges. So government folks who um, do want to be on the cutting edge uh, just don't know how exactly to get emerging technology and to, to solve their problems. We work with them on how to de-risk that, how to actually go about um, doing it on a smaller scale, and a, a lot of ends, a lot of that ends up being um, through procurement. So uh, that's where we touch a lot of the uh, the cybersecurity companies that are that are working with the federal government day in and day out. Excellent. So we'll be uh, coming to you for some of that industry perspective and 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 the other side of life. But before we get there, uh, Stephen, I'd like to start off with you as someone who is. Uh, you know, knee deep in protecting a lar one of the larger agencies out there, and you're working uh, on the the CISO Council. I feel like you would have a really good uh, ten thousand foot view of what's going on. So, what has been going on for the last two months? Uh, what what have your employees been going through? What have your fellow CISOs been going through? Break it down for us. If I if I had to summarize it in a word, it would be intense, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, intense in terms of watching the threat vector advance and take advantage of new situations and new working uh, capabilities, but also intense in the the passion and the drive for people to continue to execute the mission. And at my own agency, we went from a, a posture of about uh, 10 percent, 10 to 25 percent of our folks teleworking at any given time uh, to the high 90s in terms of our teleworking. Yeah. And we we definitely had some situations um, that were thorny. For example, on a Wednesday afternoon uh, at the department level, we made the decision, you know, it just wasn't prudent for us to keep our badging offices open. Mm. And on the surface, well, that sounds OK. Yeah, let's close the badging offices. But then we look, we use that badge, the PIV. Um, personal identity ver uh, verification. We use that to log into our laptops. We use that to log into the VPN. We use that to log into applications. And all of a sudden we're saying, as people on board or as badges get lost or broken, we're no longer gonna be able to issue those or at least not easily. Right. And so uh, we had to turn internally and we said, okay, it's Wednesday afternoon, come Monday, we need to have another solution in place. And that's where we, we drove hard into our identity and access management folks. We drove hard into our remote connectivity and security folks, the VPN and the application folks, and said, what is it going to take to build out an alternate authentication mechanism that we can deploy rapidly that's still going to meet the security requirements? Put a lot of agile um, process in place. We put a lot of things on hold and focused on that insular outcome. And come Monday morning, we were successful. We were able to issue devices, mail them out hmm. with, um, with multi-factor authentication as good as the PIV that folks could actually develop and turn on and then implement as they received the machine through our service desk, which we also had to re-engineer. And life went on. In fact, in the last seven week period, we've onboarded more employees than we have, I think in the last two or three years in that same amount of period, that seven week period. And we've been doing it using this new alternate to the PIV. So, and what it proved to us was that we can drive hard and fast when we need to. It was mm -hmm. a real watershed moment for us. A couple of questions for you on that. Uh, one, was it, was it that the badging uh, process was holding you up or were there other other things involved too as to why you've been able to speed up onboarding so much lately is it just that all the in-person interactions were slowing things down i think that it was one nobody had taken the time to look at the entire business process from snout to tail and say let's let's re-engineer it all let's let's leave no stone unturned let's re-engineer it all which is always the big, it's, the big it's, uh, uh, benefit of modernizing a, a process and digitizing it, right? You get to re-examine re that process. 
you got it, Aaron. And, you know, we looked at the, the president's management agenda, IT modernization. That was one of our drivers as we went into this. And it said, you know, be bold, be broad. And, and if you can, take the whole thing and re-engineer the whole process and as many services as you can. And that's exactly what we did. Excellent. So, you know, this is, that's interesting because I've heard a lot of stories about tech modernization happening during this, this pandemic, but that's the first time I've heard that this might finally be the kick in the pants needed to go from PIV to, or, and CAC to derived credentials. Uh, is that, is that basically what you're talking about or is it something or, uh, like a lower step down with the two factor? Yeah. So uh, for us, uh, some of it was derived credentials. Um, and then some of it was basically PIV equivalent, um, other multi-factor authenticators that meet the same AAL, IAL levels that we needed, uh, but they were not PIV. And um, what's great now is going forward, even when we return to PIV, we're going to retain these existing technologies and capabilities for devolution capability. You lose your PIV, well, it's no longer we're, we're de devolving to username and password. No, we're devolving to the PIV alternate, which includes still strong multi-factor authentication. So it was a win all around. That's cool. That's cool. I'm going to come back to you in a bit. But first, uh, Sean, I want to jump over to you for a second and talk about some of the work you all have been doing. Uh, you mentioned the timeline uh, for TIC, the Trusted Internet Connection 3.0 that, that's getting rolled out. Uh, you all, before this crisis hit, you all were working on the draft use cases for two of the, the first ones, right? The, the standard headquarters uh, and the uh, branch offices. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm summing this up in, uh, incorrectly, feel free to expand on it. But one of the problems with the current TIC architecture is that anything of any kind of sensitivity, uh, network connection wise, has to run through those branch offices uh, and headquarters offices uh, through a trusted internet connection. That means if you're working at home, you've got to tunnel all that traffic through your headquarters office. Are they doing that through VPNs? Are there other ways to speed that up? How is, how is that working today prior to some of the, uh, the newer guidance that you all put out? Sure. So I think you're talking about more the tick two policy yeah. and how, how, how it was back then. So you're exactly right where under the old policy, the agency had to route all that traffic back to those finite tick uh, access points where they had their firewalls and other security devices. And the agency's only had a few of those uh, access points. So if agency has remote users on the West Coast, those access points are on the East Coast, that traffic had to route all the way across continental United States just to get out the door, if you will, out of that castle to go then to wherever we need to go to a website. And that was the old uh, tick model, if you will, that and internal, external. And at that time, maybe you had 10, 20 percent of your employees working that way, right? Tunneling sure, through versus sure. now it's 80, 90 percent, right? So how did that affect networks? So, yeah, exactly. So once the telework search happened and, and we started to have that massive scale increase of telework search, depending on that same legacy environment and those concentrators, if you will, those VPN networks, we were starting to hear from agencies. Uh, OMB was starting to hear from agencies. And then some of the vendors themselves are saying, we need alternative solutions. And that, that's why um, also at the same time, we're hearing from some agencies because the guidance that we released in December was still draft. Some agencies mm -hmm. still looked at the old tick to as the official documentation. So when we released that interim guidance in April, we made explicitly clear this maps back to the draft guidance in December to give agencies that flexibility and the ability to think outside the box, if you will. At the same time, um, OMB, they released, a, um, I think it was a memo 2019, harnessing technology to support mission continuity. Mm -hmm. And we use that as our, our, as our green flag, if you will, to, 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 to look at alternative solutions. So that's how I, very quickly, talking to some agencies and vendors, we build out that uh, draft interim guidance that we released in April. Yeah. So uh, for those out there, we can, uh, we can tweet out stuff and send links around and all that stuff. But where can they find that interim guidance if they need it? Sure. So the uh, all the the memo, of course, OMB's memos on OMB's website, and then on CISA's website. I think if you just uh, go into your search engine, CISA uh, space trusted internet connection, it should take it right to it. It's under CISA.gov. All the documentation is there between the interim guidance uh, that released in April, the draft memo, the draft guidance that released in. Uh, um, December. We also have a frequently asked questions in there. There's a whole wealth of information there, including we have a link back to OMB and the memo itself. 
Excellent. And of course, you can search Nexco for that because we've been writing a ton about it. So what does that interim guidance say? What's it telling people to do? So if you listen um, to what Stephen was talking about, how they're using yeah. identity in new ways, this is what the interim guidance talks about. It, it still says agencies, are if they rely on VPN networks to give some uh, discussions about how the traditional ways to uh, to connect those different environments, but allows for interpretation, allows for greater flexibility. Uh, some agencies use virtual desktop interfaces, VDI. Some are more going toward a zero trust architecture. Um, so this this guidance that we came out allows for those interpretation uh, uh, by the agencies. But we, what we recognize also is exactly what Stephen was talking about, leaning more on the ICAM, the Identity Credential and Access Management Solutions. As agencies move more toward a zero trust environment mm -hmm. and more toward this remote access, agencies are going to rely more on that ICAM solution. And that's what we want to learn as we distribute this architecture, I'm sorry, release this guidance, how agencies are leveraging, just like Steve was talking about, that uh, identity management to, su to support that new environment. Yeah, so let's... Let's dig into that a little bit, and uh, don't worry, Meg, we're going to get to you. <laughs> uh, but, Stephen, if you have some more to, to add on to this one as well, feel free to jump in. Or, Meg, if you want to jump in, if you have some security background on this stuff. But, you know, you're talking about oh, just... using that icon. Well, so so how can yeah. how can you use that identity management to maintain a level of security? Because we're talking here about when people are working from home, how do you maintain security through that connection? And what we're hearing a lot of is uh, the interim guidance – does give some ways that you can route traffic to keep it from from lagging but what a lot of federal employees are being told is don't use your vpn unless you have to is that lowering the security posture for those agencies or are there other workarounds are vpns just not always necessary what is the security posture when cios tell people don't use your vpns we don't have we don't have the the the, the bandwidth for it so is that for Stephen or for me? I'm sorry. Don't Either one wants to jump in. I'll, I'll, I'll talk from the tick side. Uh, when we released the interim guidance, it did start to uh, allow more split tunneling or multi-tunneling. It is expected that those sessions are encrypted uh, between the, the, the remote user and to the service that they're trying to get to in the cloud or back uh, to the, their, their, as you said, their campus. may not be a VPN itself, maybe a session level encryption, mm -hmm. but there's still encryption on there. But like we were saying, as you rely more on the services themselves and not as much about the network below that, mm -hmm. then all those policy enforcement points have to be distributed along the path in a different way. And so you have to understand from the agency perspective where that security parity is going to come if you're not relying on the VPN that you did before. So is it going to be your cloud service provider, a CASB, something like that? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point there with the CASB, too. That was also another option we talked about in the uh, the um, guidance was the the CASBs themselves, the security as a service, where the agencies are relying on a third party to secure those connections between the remote users and the uh, cloud environment itself. So that's that's one of the challenges with TIC is while you allow this flexibility and all these different uh, um, interpretations, it's tough to get down to very specific guidance because you may then at one point put someone in a corner, an agency, where if they're doing a different architecture. Uh, it may not work that way. So we have to make sure we're capturing the principles and the objectives and then allow that uh, interpretation guidance to the agencies. So Stephen, how are you applying oh, that? It, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Meg. Sorry. And it essentially, it comes down to a, a, a little bit of like how much risk are, how much risk are we willing to take and more and more with more endpoints coming online um, and them being configured in, in multi different ways. Um, it's, it's being able to know what is hitting that network and how. Mm -hmm. um, and so we work with a lot of technology companies that are that are looking at just that. Um, but the federal government is is going to have to take on uh, some risk in this, but it has to be a calculated risk. And I think that's what TIC is um, really trying to, to guide people in the direction towards. Yeah, from, from my perspective and the agency perspective, I love that conversation around risk and uh, we've been having a lot of those conversations lately, uh, especially with my authorizing officials. Um, what's fascinating, though, is with the new guidance from CISA and the agility it's provided us, in many cases, we have found that that risk discussion, we can get to risk parity or very little additional accepted risk. And I'll give an example. Um, 
at the the CISO Council, we had several discussions about, you know, that that problem of, you know, our CIOs are getting pushed to drop the VPNs and they're getting pushed to open applications for more open internet access. And from a CISO perspective, that's terrifying. And oftentimes it came down to, well, you know, we just don't have the capacity and, and mm-hmm. we don't have the bandwidth or we don't have the throughput. And there's all this video traffic and all this audio traffic. And so, you know, we looking at what CISO says, CISO says, well, you can bifurcate a lot of that traffic, but the key is you have to change your mindset. And I love the discussion at the end point because all of a sudden the host-based firewall on the device becomes vitally important because I can start to, start to bifurcate and say, okay, all my unsecure authentication traffic or traffic that I really don't know what's going on, I'm still going to keep that in a VPN tunnel. But all of the, say, Teams or Zoom or to take your pick on teleconferencing, all that traffic, I'm going to move that outside the VPN and I'm going to whitelist the destination and source IPs on the host. And I know that's already IPsec encrypted. And so from a risk perspective, I'm encrypted in VPN. I'm encrypted IPsec. I've whitelisted my IP space. I'm in great shape. And I've just moved a tremendous burden off of that VPN infrastructure. And that's what we're seeing happening in the agency. That that would require end-to-end encryption, though, on the... Uh, the collaboration app, though, right, in order to be fully secure, because you don't have any control over that. Well, in some cases, we do have that. So, okay. um, if if an agency is using, for example, a FedRAMP authorized version of a collaboration tool, we do have a lot of insight there, and that's another approach that pretty much every agency is doing now. They've snuffed out a lot of times through CASB third-party or unknown um, collaboration tools and said, hey leverage the department's capability for hosting because we do have assurances of record retention and security there. Excellent. Meg, I want to go over to and you. And there's for collaboration tools. That are commercial. Oh, sorry. There are collaboration okay. tools that are commercial off the shelf now that are specifically focused on um, protecting files, protecting video chats, protecting messages and voice communication. Um, for DOD standards and and being actually offered. So like tools like Wicker and things like that, that um, I know is especially the Air Force is taking advantage of of some of those where it does already, it's it's built with security in mind. It's built with the government as the end customer in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to jump into a discussion starting with you, Meg, uh, about how much work can be done from home. So we've got you know, uh, two security experts here who can talk to us about how you secure the things. But when you talk to, especially like uh, uh, defense industrial uh, uh, businesses, right? The, the uh, defense industrial base, the DIB, uh, can they do their work at home when they're working with controlled, unclassified information, secret, top secret, compartmentalized? How much of that can, are they doing remotely? And how much of that is just going to have to wait? Yeah. Um, so it's gonna. So some of it's gonna have to wait. But um, I think that in a lot of the highly classified environments, what we've been seeing is um, people still going into going into their office where they have to, and just doing it in a way where you get more of a, a shift work mentality, um, and that might keep up in the short term, that might keep up in the medium term, that might even keep up in the longer term. Um, So we're seeing a difference, a huge difference in um, classified versus unclassified. Um, But for example, we run a a program uh, for uh, leaders in the DOD that is specifically around how to get emerging technology in the door. And while a bunch of them are working on classified problems, because we're working with NGA, we're working at DOD, Uh, A lot of the actual challenges that they're talking about, that this data set doesn't talk to this data set, um, isn't classified. And so they can they can do a lot of the work on um, on on many things in an unclass environment. So I'm seeing a lot of uh, a lot of work getting done in the unclass space and then Mm -hmm. uh, a, a bunch of people actually just becoming shift workers and and going in where they have to go in, whether that's for you know, labs, forensics, SCIFs, et cetera. There's, there's a lot of places where they, it just, it has not been a, has not been an option. Yeah. Yeah. Steven, how's that been working out over at education? Uh, I'm trying to think probably the most sensitive information you all process would be like student loan applications and other stuff with 
with uh, financial information. Um, I imagine people aren't allowed to just take that paper home. So how are you making sure that those things can continue on in a, in a secure fashion? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the number one push in that place where we just had a surge of innovation was around electronic and digital signatures. Um, yeah. And we have the IDEA Act, which, uh, you know, it, it's on the table. We, we, we need to be doing this. And, you know, this pandemic was really the push to say, well, we can issue printers to folks at home. We can accept the risk that they'll connect whatever printer they may have to our machines, or we can surge hard and push with for uh, electronic and digital signatures. And we chose the latter. Um, we said, uh, you know, if there's a process that absolutely must have a wet ink signature, what is it? Because we're going to get that in front of our general counsel and say, why is it legally required and where can we provide a digital equivalent? Mm -hmm. And that has been uh, incredible. Uh, we still have some folks in some very niche areas where, yeah, we do need a wet signature and we've had to issue printers at home to make that happen. Um, but it's also that risk equation. You know, people will say, right, but you're not the NSA. You allow people to walk out with roller bags of, of work every night. So, you know, is the, the trust level different because they're printing it at home versus printing it at work and then and bringing it home. Mm -hmm. And so there's some discussions there that happen with leadership because uh, the, everybody resets to the new normal. And sometimes we forget what the old normal was and what we were actually <laughs> accepting risk at that point. Yeah. But the other interesting thing, and, and please correct me if I'm misinterpreting your comments from today, but what I keep hearing from you is, yes, there are Tech, there, the technical solution is a component of the solution, but more often than not, your answer for fixing a security problem seems to be re-engineer the process first and just come at it from a different angle. 100%. And the beautiful thing is almost all the technologies we need, all the guidance and, and architectures, like from our friends at CISA, it's all there. It's all there. It's really getting the business process re-engineered and then bringing in these drivers to, to get that solution. And that's what's really driven our success. Yeah. And in that, oh, so go ahead, it's nice to have kind of a in the pants uh, re COVID to do some of that. How much of that did you actually have like the, the building blocks in place for, because some of these big process, I was at the small business administration when we were talking about wet signatures and it's a tough issue. Um, but how much did you have the building blocks in place before COVID? So what was incredible was um, when we did the PIV alternate, um, the reason we were able to do that in, in five days, uh, which most of our folks that we've discussed that with said, no, that's a 30 to 60 day type of deployment. We did it in five days because the first thing we did is we pulled in the enterprise architect and said, where do we have these capabilities? Where do we have ICAM? Where do we have authentication services? Where do we have logging and monitoring? Where do we have these services that we already own? And come to find out in that particular situation, we owned everything we needed already. It was just putting it all together. And that was the reason we were able to deploy so quickly. On electronic signatures, that one was a little more difficult because often Oftentimes that was embedded in the guts of a lot of our legacy applications. And so uh, through our governance processes, working through IT modernization, we had to push basically electronic signatures and digital signatures to the forefront of the requirements and say, developers, start working here. And that was a little harder because we didn't necessarily have all the knowledge and the skills and in some cases the technologies needed uh, to make that happen. So there's a little longer tail on that deployment. And Stephen, do you have developers in your office or did you have to go to the CIO and, and ask for help on that? Yeah, that was a, that was definitely a team sport, not just the CIO. Um, at the Department of Education, we're very proud on our FATARA scorecard that we report zero government data centers. So we are basically 100% outsourced. So it's not just the CIO, it's the program manager on the government side, and then our partners in the vendor and contracting space. And if that team has to come together and just really consolidate on the objective, and when it happens, it's magic. If any of those pieces are out of alignment, it's gonna be a real rough march. Yeah, but one other thing, uh, then Sean, I'm gonna throw something at you, and then uh, we're gonna go on to audience Q&A. So if you have questions, start getting those into that Q&A chat so we can get to that. Uh, but Stephen, you mentioned before, you know, we were talking about these, these ideas for how to do end arounds uh, on your security problems. Uh, I imagine you're not coming up with all of those yourself. And even if you did, uh, I, I know you'd be too humble to admit it. But 
I know you also are, at least you were meeting daily with the, the CISO council. Are you all still meeting at that frequency? Um, we are not. Um, we're back to more or less a, a regular cadence. Uh, the good news was the daily meetings uh, met the objective. Um, it managed evolution. It managed communication and the sharing of ideas. Uh, pretty much all the ideas that I've talked about here um, were either shared in those forums or uh, provided in those forums. And so right now, most agencies are at a pretty good state. Mm -hmm. But so that gets to my, the heart of my where, where I was going with the question, which is, if I'm a CISO or the, the um, senior official in charge of security or whatever for my agency or program, I'm not sitting on the CISO council, let's say, uh, but I need to know these things. I, need, I have ideas. I need ideas, whatever the like. Where can I go? Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to give you, you three different areas. Of course, there's your, your agency says, oh, folks like me. Uh, I know every single one of the CFO Act CISOs and a bunch of CISOs at the, the other agencies, and, and not a single one of them would turn someone away if they, they came and said, hey, I, I need help. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely step uh, stop one. Uh, stop two, OMB's website um, and the OMB memorandums, especially around identity management and the president's management agenda, super helpful in establishing guideposts during times of uncertainty and rapid change. And then third, our friends over at CISA, uh, the organization Sean's with, they're really our operational arm in the security space. They're our trusted partners on the government side and helping us make sure that as we're deploying technologies or we need additional insights or engineering or, or just assessment help, they're there to help us as well. So I think there's three great areas where folks can turn to. And then a fourth I'll add is even organizations like act I act uh, mm. Cybersecurity Community of Interest, um, I'm the government chair there. Lots of great collaboration happening there between government and industry. Um, and uh, there's several groups out there like that that should also be considered. Wonderful. So, Sean, uh, before Stephen was talking about how everything that you need is out there, right? You can get all the help you need. The ideas are out there. The solutions are out there. The guidance is out there. Uh, that's almost true. You, you, you said multiple times, Sean, that uh, the interim remote use case guidance is just that, interim. So uh, what's the, the schedule look like for the final uh, remote use case? And uh, what, how, how do you think that's going to be different than this interim guidance? Why, why is that worth waiting for? Yeah, let me uh, step back a little bit. So we released that draft guidance in December. And then in January, you had an RFC comment period. Um, extended a little bit into February. And from that, we received somewhere between 350 and 400 comments. And so uh, in beginning of March, we started to adjudicate all those comments. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty mature process to be able to um, make sure because there's, I think we released somewhere close to eight or nine total documents if you count them mm -hmm. all up individually. And so to be able to review all those is what has been our primary focus. Uh, when the telework surge happened, though, we had to shift our resources a little bit to get the uh, uh, that guidance out the door. So our, our immediate um, primary goal right now is to get that adjudicated uh, documentation out the door, the core documents from December. Uh, we plan to release that sometime this summer. Mm -hmm. There's a number of stakeholders and partners that we need to uh, work with both through OMB and GSA. So there's a number of signatures, if you will, that have to be put to this. And so it's hard to uh, decide the actual you know, day when it's going to happen, but I anticipate to release that documentation this summer. That'll include that traditional tech use case mm -hmm. that we mentioned, but also include the branch office use case. Um, and then after that, that's really where the fun be begins. That's where a lot of this collaboration will start to happen. We can start to have more of those interagency working groups that we've had before, bring the um, CISOs and the architects into the room, and we can start to distill lessons learned from what they've done, especially around the uh, telework guidance that we talked about and the ways that they're uh, being able to use that guidance. We'll distill those lessons learned, and then we have those use cases that we're still on the hook for that's in OMB's memo, mm -hmm. um, emails of service, PaaS, SaaS, infrastructure. So we need to get those use cases out the door, we call that phase two, if you will. Phase one is getting that documentation that we talked about before, up, released this summer. Phase two is getting that second set of use cases out the door as soon as possible. After that, but we need to build pilots off of that. Through the federal CISO council, there'll be pilots working to um, to support those use cases. And then we have what we call phase three, which is potential other use cases, mm -hmm. zero trust, partner networks, unified communications. 
those are all anticipated. Uh, but again, we need to get those that phase two out the door beforehand. Excellent. All right, let's hit up uh, some of these audience questions. Uh, feel free to keep submitting them. We've got about 10 minutes here. So uh, let's see how many we can get through. So uh, uh, someone from a federal contractor asks, how are you protecting data in transit, particularly given the expanded threat surface due to remote working, single points of failure associated with key management certificates and static stored encryption keys? Well, certificates and static, and then they just ask stored encryption keys as though that might be a potential answer. So you yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Oh, go ahead, Sean. Now, I was just going to say from our side, um, we do rely, as we mentioned before, on encryption. There is a stronger reliance on the uh, server side and the client side. I think one thing, and Meg was talking about this a little bit before, was when we, were, when we um, rely on the, the that secure edge, if you will, the, the client and the server side, the telemetry that's now available from those environments is much richer. It's a much different uh, paradigm, if you will, an old TIC2 model, receiving that situation awareness. One of the reasons for TIC2 was because security couldn't scale 10 years ago, and you had to consolidate all those circuits. Now, since security can scale, you can start to expand that um, those connections, if you will, so they don't have to go through those access points. So we, so we are relying on that encrypted traffic on that path, but relying more on the server side and the client side be able to give that telemetry back to us to make it make it give it a visibility back to the agency and to CISA. Hmm. Steven? Yeah, I'll, say, I'll say from the agency side, uh, especially as it relates to certificates and making sure that we're keeping those up to snuff and up to date and, and we're, we're leveraging those appropriately for encryption. Uh, for us, we're really looking at how we execute that through the continuous diagnostics and mitigation program at DHS, uh, particularly in their behave section. Um, they have a very robust maturity model around certificate management, certificate security, and we're aligning our certificate management and execution and security um, basically around that approach. So it's a great reference to, to check out if you're interested in that space. Excellent. Next, we have uh, someone writing in from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, they ask, can derived credentials be rolled into federal ICAM? Uh, I think I'll just say I, from 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 what I know of the, the attempts at this, I think that's the the big idea that that tends to be the hard part. Uh, Stephen, what's been your experience there? Yeah, that is that is absolutely the hard part, and. Uh, from an ICAM perspective, you you have to have just such a, a high level of maturity around uh, PKI and how your PKI infrastructure has been architected, uh, but then also the device or the services that you're actually going to have those derived credentials, making sure that um, you, you have all those right links in place because of course the derived credential is based on the parent credential. And um, for us, we're still working through that. The ideal deployment, and some folks in DISA have done this exceptionally well, is with mobile devices. Mobile devices are the derived credential uh, panacea as it were, you know, use my phone to unlock my computer, use my yeah. phone to get into the building. Um, this has done some great work in that space. And I would say if you're interested in seeing folks who are doing it well, look at some of this work that they've published out there because they've done a great job. Now, I know this is going to be getting way ahead of you, but Sean, have you looked at all at how that would work under a trusted internet connection? If, my, if I'm at a coffee shop and my phone is my CAC, how do I ensure that the validation of that derived credential is itself running over a trusted connection? Could that be another so, access point? Yeah, I don't. Part of the challenge is um, with, with the TIC program, we have to have that flexibility uh, to the agencies. We are the risk advisors and the risk tolerance is up to the agency itself. Um, so I, it's tough for me to come out with one definitive statement that would work for all 100 plus agencies. But I think when we are talking to agencies about this, there are some agencies that are looking at this more like what you're just explaining, whether it be that, that multi-tunnel or separate channel for that. I'm not in a position to say all agencies are ready to support that. Um, and I think one thing, especially as we start going toward that zero trust model, is that we, we start talking about, and Stephen's uh, 
he mentioned the act I act council and they talked about this, especially Dan Jacobs, how trust has a half life, uh, trust decays over time, trust decomposes. Mm -hmm. So there's all that, um, if you will, that the um, infrastructure and just the architectures rely about building that trust and then reestablishing that trust also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, just the, the challenge to me, it sounds like, is when you're that, that last part where you're reestablishing the trust, how do you ensure that that right then is secure? No, I agree. And that, that's part of what we start going toward that. Uh, I mentioned before, remote user use case would build out that interim telework guidance. Right. We're also looking at a zero trust use case potentially. I think that's where we explore those discussions. We'll be looping back with agencies. I mentioned the, the interagency working groups. Hearing from them, we, we typically have participation from more 50 plus agencies in these working groups. So we'll get a broad range of discussions from the agencies. And then we'll distill those down into those first order principles, if you will, and give that advice or that um, guidance to the agencies to let them interpret how they will. Excellent. A, uh, another federal contractor uh, from a separate vendor asks uh, Meg, you mentioned DOD security standards, and one of those is NSA's Commercial Solutions for Classified, which is, uh, for those unaware, it's the list of, of stuff you're allowed to use because it's deemed safe. Oh. That allows DOD entities to use COTS technology and deploy them in an accredited network architecture that allows transmission of classified data at different levels. Has there been any discussion within the civilian agencies to do something similar, even if it is for unclassified but still sensitive data? Uh, so, Sean, I'm going to get that to you. But first, Meg, uh, is that something? Is that what you were you were mentioning before? And have you heard anything about this uh, from the people you work with? Yeah, we've heard some mention of it in the in the civilian space um, because a lot of the dual use technology that we're working with is going to be considered COTS. Um, and so, what we're seeing is this increased attention at DoD for sure. Um, but some of the civilian agencies um, are really trying to partner with the private sector to be able to start vetting these commercial solutions because it's not just about is it a COTS product, but what is the security of that COTS product is really, really important. Um, and, and being able to get on that on that white list of secured COTS products. Um, and then being able, so, so for civilian agencies as well as, the, as DOD and, and an NSA to, to find those um, commercially available technologies and also be able um, to know that they are vetted for that government use case, we think is really important. Um, so we've, we have like this robust evaluation program, um, but we are seeing it more and more. We get a lot of inbound from the civilian side on what can I use? How can I use it? Um, and, and what should I be looking for, um, as far as some of these different COTS technologies and what, what's going to be easily plugged in and what is going to take a, a little bit more of a lift on the, um, on the government agency side to, uh, to get it up to speed. Hmm. Sean, what are you seeing in, in that realm? Yeah, I need to be both careful and clear from my side. So the tech programs focus on the unclassified side environment. And then TICS also, uh, also scoped for the federal civilian executive branch. So we're not, the TIC program is scope over DOD, but we work hand in hand with our partners at DOD. Um, but one thing we're interested in, and we talked about those potential use cases, is we want to have a partner use case. And those partners can be uh, from banks to research and development to that civilian industrial base. And so that's where you want to explore those type of connections and the type of security that you put around those type of environments. Again, on the unclassified side and the non-DOD side. Mm -hmm, definitely. And we are running up against time. So, uh, Stephen, did you want to give any uh, final thoughts on that? Um, uh, what I'll say is that we, we do have some great parallels in uh, other spaces in the federal civilian side. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, the FedRAMP program uh, ran out of GSA, while it's not devices per se, what we've essentially done is said, um, here's a set of standards that we want any cloud provider in the U.S. 
um, contracting space to meet. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to do business with cloud, with the federal government, this is how it's going to be. And and you're going to participate in this program. And I think that that works as a model in many ways. And I think that there, there is potential for us to explore it further and to, you know, do we extend a similar model in different supply chains, whether it's Mm -hmm. devices or endpoints or whatever the case may be. So I think we've got some, some good practices already in place. And I know that from a supply chain perspective, especially with the requirements of the SECURE Act coming due uh, for many of us in August, September, um, I think a lot of us are looking at that and what that could eventually uh, become. Yeah. And then, of course, there's that third stool of security, right? You've got the, uh, uh, the devices, the products with FedRAMP, and then uh, we actually made it an entire uh, cybersecurity focused webcast without mentioning CMMC. So uh, with that, Goodbye, everyone. No. So, uh, th- yeah, yeah, we've got that other that other aspect of uh, the companies themselves, and how do you make sure that that they're secure? Uh, there will be more discussion on that to come, I'm sure, but we don't have time for that today. So, uh, with that, thank you everyone for joining me. Uh, this, uh, uh, oh, excuse me, that concludes our session. Uh, thank you so much, to Meg, Sean, Steve, for joining us. The next session coming up is on the CARES Act impact. That'll begin at 11:30. And will feature Sheena Burrell, Deputy Chief Information Officer for the National Archives and Records Administration, and Jessica Bonjourney, Chief Human Capital Management, ah, Chief Human Capital Management at the Veterans Health Administration. During the break, we encourage you to visit the exhibit hall and the chat room, and we'll see you back for the CARES Act Impact in 15 minutes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much.